Coming to you from the Stream.TV studios in Hollywood, California, Pensado's Place is brought to you by Vintage King, Avid, Recording Connection, and the Blackbird Academy. Our returning champion is of Drumbrella fame. You know who that is. We got a big announcement, a brand new ITL. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. <laughs> oh, 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 yay. <laughs> All right, tip your waitresses, drive safe, see you next time. Good night. I mean, how can I beat that? <laughs> You're festive, man. You're in a festive mood today. I, I am. It is Christmas time, and we what, are... did you get three hours sleep or something about, this week? About, so, it's, so oh. I'm really rested. <laughs> you, you sound like it. Exactly. How are you, man? Oh, you know what? Um, everything's great, and if it wasn't, I'd lie and say it was. You know me. <laughs> well, it's been a good week. I, I, um, um, our guests will attest, uh, we tend to evaluate our life based on the quality of our work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had yeah. a good week. You did. What can and, I say? And you're excited about the Macy thing, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's going to be cool. Yeah. We'll, we'll tell them more about that later. Okay. We got, we're jam-packed. Shall we get to it? Do it. Cool. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hope your week was great. And you are getting into the Christmas spirit like we are. You can see our set. We got boxes and stuff. Uh, so around here, it is Christmas time. And we're going to get to play Santa in a couple minutes. Right, Dave? That's going to be pretty cool. 100% right. Yep, absolutely. So as always, we thank you for your likes and subscribes. Yeah. You empower us so we can empower you. Speaking of empowerment, Vintage King, what's up? Plans are in the works for 2014. Some cool stuff is being discussed. We'll get to you on that. Our Avid family, we are busy planning our NAM appearance. Um, we're going to be on the floor for three straight days. Details on that coming to you soon. And by the way, what a great week to be in L.A. Grammys that week, NAM in the same week, and then, of course, the granddaddy of all the shows, Pizzotto's Place. <laughs> <laughs> we shut down NAM three times last year. We, sh we should go for something better this year. Also, our friends at Recording Connection, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that team is busy preparing some January surprises f with us for you, which you're going to love. So lots of stuff going on. And then, ho, 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 <laughs> our newest family member, the Blackbird Academy, uh, let me tell you guys, they are not messing around. Oh, they, no. John McBride. <laughs> does not mess around. They are rocking with Pensado's Place hard. So check this out. Dave and I and John McBride are extremely proud to announce Pensado's Place, the Blackbird Academy, full scholarship for January, two two, for January 2014. Yet, yeah, you heard me correctly. This is a full scholarship valued at over $20,000 for you have one of the 30 most coveted seats in audio education on the planet. We're going to announce this winner the day after Christmas. On December 26th, we'll announce the scholarship winner, and the session starts the following month in January. Enter fast. Find out soon if you win. Plus, yes, there is a plus. There's always a plus. There's <laughs> a plus. This stuff. I do. I do love Sham it. Sham wow. Five of you will be picked to have an all expense paid flyaway trip in January to Blackbird Studios in Nashville, where you'll get a personal tour of the facility by John McBride. Now, let, let, let me just tell you right now if you're fortunate enough to win that flyaway, pack a lunch. Hydrate yourself, put some <laughs> lotion on, prepare to have your audio minds blown. Your meter is literally going to peg. It happened to Dave and I, correct? Yeah, it was fun. Uh, you, you will absolutely enjoy this, trust us. So those five winners will be announced sometime in January, and the trip will be in January. So additionally, once all that is unpacked, our Pensado's Place Nashville correspondent, Stephanie Spitfire Willis, she'll be on hand to interview the winners for a special segment on your experience, and we'll air that on a future episode of Pensado's Place. So let's, let's put it all together. One winner, full ride, $20,000 scholarship, announced December 26th. Five winners to be picked for an all-expense paid trip to Nashville with a personal tour by John McBride, plus a segment on Pensado's Place. How do you enter? Go to pensadosplace.tv forward slash blackbird. Put in your info, answer two questions, and you're eligible. 
It's that simple. Will has all the information on the page there. We will get those names week by week to the Blackbird Academy for them to process. So I'm telling you, Dave's telling you, hit it and hit it hard. Real quick thing, they talk about opportunity and when it comes oh, up man, in your if, life. If you watch the show, which I hope you do, uh, one thing you notice about every guest, their, their, their opportunity came and they jumped on it. There was no hesitation. It, it's better to take an opportunity that looks good and, and change later than to bypass one. There you have it. You've got a great institution. The yeah. tuition is erased. It's taught by extraordinary teachers. You get superstar guest lecturers inside one of the greatest recording facilities that exist. It doesn't get much better. It doesn't get much bigger. And we, we're just thrilled to announce that winner the day after Christmas, December 26th. Don't have to wait on this. So ho, ho, ho. A actually, it's probably ho, ho, expletive deleted ho, <laughs> right? <laughs> Pensadosplace.tv forward slash Blackbird. Absolutely rocking, and uh, it's going to be great. Yeah. Uh, before you introduce the IT, ITL, mm -hmm. really quickly, um, your response to the Pensado Awards has been nothing short of amazing. We've got folks from all of the community coming together and more and more engagement. Uh, we literally have heard from folks in Russia. We've heard from TV reporters, pros like Greg Wells and the, and the aforementioned folks, Tony Maserati and Young Guru have reached out. We've heard from YouTubers, and most importantly, we've heard from you. And we're all, we're going to make this a level playing field. So we thank you so much. Let's, this show is your show. We're going to put it on. It's for you, by you. Uh, Will is putting more and more fun rewards on our page. So go to fundanything.com forward slash Pensado. Check in there. Huge undertaking. Going to be special. Dave and I thank you so much for your help. Plus, get yourself some merch for Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Lots of stuff for this Christmas. We're happy to bring all this stuff to you. Let's party with it. David? Introduce our ITL. It's a short ITL this week, but a good one. Uh, I picked a bad week to run an ITL on guitars with Eric here, but I'm pretty proud of it. Check it out. Uh, an ITL back or two, I showed you um, this song, What's Your Fantasy by Gayla Brown, um, my friend Patrick Smodja. I really love what I did on these guitars, so I want to show you uh, what I did on these guitars. See if you can find anything in here you, that you might apply to your own situation. So here's the guitars. Okay. They kind of sit in the track really cool, kind of Earth, Wind & Fire style. Now here's, here's what they sound like. Okay, so here's what I started with. Let's pick this guitar first. Uh, it's a little louder because I turned the gain down here. Let me give you a little more representation accurately. Just smoothed it out, took the frequencies that fit in the track nicely. So let's just check this guitar in the track. Okay, so I've got a little compression. I pulled up some top end, pulled down some low end, added a touch of flange, touch of verb. Love it, love it, love it, love it. On this guitar, we had to do a little more work. This plug-in, Colin McDowell's uh, Chrome Tone, very underutilized plug-in. I use it a lot. I'm adding a little chorus. Let's check it in the track. I love this stuff. Hold on. The 
concept here is trying to create a space for the guitarist to sit where they can proudly be rhythmic and, and, and add to the groove, but, but without stepping over a lot of the other elements. We've got a Rhodes going on, we've got some other things going on, some horns, so and then when the vocals come in, we've got to have a little spot for those. And um, plenty of ways to do it. This is the way I did it. All right, guys. So guys, take that ITL, you know what you do, process, use it, make your stuff better, and then let us know about it. Um, God, I, it's easy to say that in the early years of the show, certain folks help move the show along. I was giddy when Eric came on the first time. <laughs> Absolutely, moment. and I gotta tell you, our, our guest, Eric Valentine, the returning champion, um, both his visit and the, we did a studio, we did an early kind of rudimentary studio tour Mm -hmm. of Eric's studio, mm -hmm. and his drumbrella has powered this show for the last three years. <laughs> Eric, welcome, man. Yeah, it's great to be back. Good to see Thanks you. Thanks for having me again. Things have changed a little. Yeah? Yeah, from the last time we were at the little round table. And yeah, the black yeah, it's a, a nice new spot. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool. Dave, fire away, sir. Oh, man. Hold on. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> That's not a plug. I needed it. Okay. <laughs> you get to have it. Eric, one of the things that, that I've always wanted to talk to you about is a lot of times, <clears throat> I'm not saying you do this, but just speak for the genre. When, when you're trying to emulate the sound of the 60s, um, how do you capture that sound but simultaneously sound modern? Or is the concept to not sound modern for a lot of these records that you and I like? Not your records necessarily. Um, I mean, I love the sound of, of 60s recordings and, and, um, and it's definitely been very influential for me. I've definitely sort of injected that in a lot of projects that I work on. And, you know, for me, like, I, I don't want to just try and exactly recreate a, a recording from the 60s that's already been done. Mm -hmm. I, there's, there's things about the sound that I find very appealing, and I want to try and incorporate that into something new in a new way. Mm -hmm. And for me, the biggest difference between contemporary recordings and, and recordings from the 60s is definitely the low end. Like, the amount of low end that you could have in a, in a recording back then was just it was just significantly less. I yeah. mean, the vinyl just wouldn't wouldn't be able to to handle it, and so um, the the whole the overall frequency spectrum was just narrowed down. They didn't you, you couldn't extend as high in, you know in the high end. You couldn't get as far down in the low end, and so I like to sort of you know use the textures from that era, but but keep the um, you know the frequencies range expanded like a modern record, and and particularly the low end. Like that's where. You know, those those 60s records, a lot of times the kick drums focused like around 100 hertz or something, you know, and it's mm -hmm. like, you know, modern records are just in a totally, they're an octave lower than that, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'll try and do is like have the mid range and the top end feel more like a 60s record, but put a modern low end on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I find that like, if you, if you put that modern low end, if you get that going right, you can put almost anything on top of it and it'll be a modern record. It's, it's all about the low end for me. Gotcha. Sometimes, sometimes, here again, I'm not talking about you, just want to get this off my chest, but sometimes I feel like people are trying to emulate the sound of the older records because they don't have any ideas to make a new modern record with. Right. <laughs> so, so you can always go back and copy the Beatles if you can't think of anything new. Right. But, but one of the things I like about your records is you, you simultaneously pay respect to the music that you grew up loving, but I never feel like I'm not listening to a modern record. How do you accomplish, well, you just mentioned a couple of ways you accomplish that. Is it all in the EQ or is it other techniques that you use? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think like what you're saying is that, you know, I love the, the sense of nostalgia in the sound. So it makes you feel like this is something, I'm listening to something that feels sort of timeless or it's been around for a long time, but I want it to be, you know, s just sonically substantial. You know, so when it comes in, it, it has the strength of a modern record. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, for me, a lot of that, um, you know, it just comes the way it's compressed, the way it's EQ'd. I mean, it, it, everything always ends up coming down to that, particularly the EQing. Like, the, the more and more I do this, the, the more I realize how important, how important the EQing is and just voicing the instruments in, in a way where they're not fighting against each other. They all complement each other in the right way. So. Mm -hmm it feels like everything's up front. Nothing's getting buried because they're not fighting against each other, you know. Gotcha. Um, one of the things that, that I have trouble 
while I'm on this kind of bitchy mode. Mm. Um, I don't understand the concept of recording something on tape and then transferring it to Pro Tools. So you put it on tape because you don't like the digitalness, but then you put it on Pro Tools, which is digitalness. Right. How, how do you, that sounds like a conundrum to me. Yeah, it's a really good question, you know, and, and uh, I've, I've talked quite a bit about, you know, the difference between digital and analog and interviews in the past and, and um, you know, it's been a real process for me, you know, having started on tape machines and uh, had a workflow that I was really comfortable with, with tape machines and having computers, you know, become more and more a part of my workflow and just trying to figure out how to make those things work together. And, um, and, and honestly, it hasn't really been until the last few years where I feel like I'm actually finally settling on a workflow where the tape machine and the computer are actually really working together in a very seamless way, and I'm getting all the benefits of both of them. And um, so with, with your point about going tape machine first and then computer, um, there was early on I, I felt like um, I felt like there was a degradation to, to digital stuff. And I think some of the very early incarnations of digital converters mm -hmm. and the lower resolution stuff was audibly, you know, degrading, you know, mm -hmm. degrading the sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember I had like one of the original like Sony F1 converters that worked oh, with like, wow. a, like a Betamax machine, you yeah. know? And, and they originally touted it as like, this is generationless audio. You know, you can copy it as many times as you want. You'll n yeah. it, it never goes like, away. And it's like, no. man, you record back and forth two times. And it's like, this thing sounds like Swiss cheese. Right. Like, there's nothing left of this sound. Mm -hmm. And no so I think. No offense to the Swiss. Yeah. <laughs> or cheese. Oh, cheese. <laughs> yeah. It'd be better if we were eating the results, I suppose. Um, and so I think that experience early on just left me really wary of like, just the overall sonic performance of digital stuff. It's improved vastly since then. I think it's yeah. just a really, really different situation. I think we're there. Yeah. I mean, you might disagree, but I think now you just choose what you like. Yeah, and so it took time for me to figure out that really what I was missing, what was unsatisfying for me with digital, wasn't that it was degrading the sound. It's that it wasn't enhancing the sound with the kind of harmonic coloration that I was getting from tape right. machines. Mm -hmm. Mm. And so that's what was really significant about the tape machines for me. Mm -hmm. Like, so if so if I if I made if I talked Dave Hill into making the perfect tape machine emulator, you would skip the tape, use the emulator. If and that exists, I would use it for sure. <laughs> and and I have lots of tape emulation plugins, you know, mm. and and I also have lots of the real versions of those tape machines, mm. and I compare them constantly, and they're incredibly close now. Mm. They're really, really close, but still, and me and the engineers that work in the building, when we have opportunities to do it, and there are exceptions, but a lot of times when we'll put it through either my original Ampex 350 tube tape machine or an mm. MM1200 or the old Scully mm. or a J37, mm. and you hear the real thing happen, you're just like, it's not quite there yet, you know? I mean, it's, it's really close. But you played much, I'm sorry, go ahead. Hurt. I was gonna say, are artists coming to you with preferences and you know, in terms of the way they've recorded songs, whether the case may be, or are they, letting, are they trusting you to sort of manage the process? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I, I have more young artists excited about working with analog tape machines mm -hmm. than, than, you know, older artists that really lived through it. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? yeah. it's like, new for them. It was right. so funny, you know, like on the, the, uh, the first Slash record, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Lemmy was in there and, um, you know, we were all really excited about, yeah, we're going to do this all on tape machines. And he's like, oh, that's the worst idea ever. I hated that. I love computers, you know? Well, that's, you know, uh, gosh, you got to love Lemmy. Yeah. It, the, one thing digital does really well is vocals. You, I, oh, yeah, I, for I, sure. I, nobody can tell me you can do vocals as good in the analog world as you can on the, You know, while you brought up that Slash record, um, I love that record. Mm. By the Sword is my favorite song on that record. Cool, yeah. Uh, you mind talking about that a little bit? Sure, yeah. The the do you remember the acoustic guitar? A Martin mm -hmm. sounds like a D eighteen D. Yeah, it's it was a Martin that slash slash owned. Yeah. And um, how did you mic that? It, 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 I think, guys, go check out the record Slash. The record's called Slash. The artist is Slash. The song is down in the middle of the pile. It's called By the Sword. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Stockdale. Yeah, yeah, is the guest artist. I'm telling you, it's a lesson in how to get a great acoustic guitar sound. So teach us what you did. 
Um, sure, yeah, I think that one was, uh, um, I actually did an MS on that one. So, I mean, there's, there's really only three ways that I usually approach acoustic guitar. If it's going to be a mono sound, that's sort of placed to one side or the other. Um, you know, it's just one mic placed on the guitar. Um, uh, I do a stereo thing where I'll come above and below um, the sound hole, usually around the 12th, 15th fret, somewhere in there. And then the other one is MS, and uh, that one I'm, I'm quite certain was, was MS because... Um, it the, sounds a little stereo-y. It, it does. And stereo -y a term? Yeah, it is now. <laughs> it is now, absolutely. Um, and uh, MS, you have a lot more control over how, how stereo it is, and it also has a tendency to sort of lean a little bit one direction to the other. And so the intro of that song, um, there's, a, there's a point where there's a 12-string guitar that comes in that's going to be sort of panned opposite it. And so the acoustic guitar starts off with a more sort of natural um, stereo placement where you can kind of hear it sort of leaning a little bit to one side, you know, uh, and you hear a little bit of the space around it. And then when the, uh, you know, the electric 12-string uh, comes in, I can lean it a little further in that direction. And so it's a more subtle stereo uh, effect than having two separate microphones that are like hard panned out. You know? uh, um, I was trying to formulate my, le my next question. And did, did you say what kind of mics you used? Uh, I think it was, a, n no, it was a pair of 67s because I oh. need the cardioid and then oh, the Fig right. 8. Yeah. yeah. Herb, did you notice when he was describing where he was putting stuff in the mix, he went to a full on visual Mm -hmm. description like a painting mode. Mm -hmm. Is that how you think about constructing the mix? Because it, it, uh, it, it rewind the tape and watch his face when he's describing where he's putting the acoustic in, in relationship to the 12 string and you, 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 really, you really think visually when you're constructing the sure, pan yeah. pattern. Yeah, I, I definitely want to like, especially with, you know, a really classic rock project like that, yeah. you know, it's like they were set up in a room, you know, Andrew was set up, he was playing 12 string, you know. Um, we ultimately overdubbed the, uh, the acoustic, but, you know, there is sort of a layout to how it's set up. And I so you started with that plan in your head? Yeah, for sure. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. What a cool thing. On the record when, I don't know how to describe it, but man, it's like, um, it's just those moments you live for musically. When the whole band comes in, I had headphones on, and I set the level for the level of the acoustic guitar. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and when the band came in, I was like, oh, shit. And, and my wife goes, are you okay? I'm like, no, this is incredible. <laughs> Man. And you did it with your, with your little scully. And you did it with uh -huh. a, a couple of guitars. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure the bass. I don't remember the bass, to be candid with you. All I remember is those guitars hitting me smacking me in the face and the mm -hmm. drums just smacking me in the face what a great moment you set me yeah. up for that how, yeah how much time and to your point then you must spend an enormous an inordinate amount of time sort of preparing that picture mm -hmm. and how you're going to in your approach and your attack right yeah i mean i usually sort of map out as far as like the stereo placement and stuff okay we're going to have a 12 string we're going to have an acoustic mm -hmm. um slash is going to play two main guitar parts and like where those are going to be placed in the stereo field which one comes and goes when mm -hmm. so it's all going to work out you know but you also didn't leave room because because most guys of your caliber and day's caliber always i find just like an athlete leave room for that instinctive moment for that character moment it's it's not planned so perfectly that you you leave room for magic yeah for sure and and you know i think some people i, I don't think planning ever inhibits the spontaneity mm -hmm. for me it's mm -hmm. like i've found with bands like the more sort of rehearsed and comfortable they are with the parts that they know they want to play and it's like i know i have this then it can free them up to do more spontaneous stuff yeah, if they're not really sure about what they're playing in the first place then they're just trying to figure out what they're doing Absolutely. the whole time. That's so true. I never thought Absolutely. of that that Absolutely. way, but in a lot of the bands I've been in, going in front of a large crowd prepared is just the most fun thing on earth. Yeah. Going in front of a small crowd unprepared is just torture. Yeah, yeah. life without structure is dangerous, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, the guitar sounds are incredible. Uh, so I guess we could slash the credit for that. But, sure, yeah. But you dispelled a couple of myths, like, 
the concept, especially the British guys, had us trained into thinking if you want a large guitar sound, you use a small amp. Right. But, but he brought in his stack as Marshall and just wailed away. It yeah. was loud, apparently. You said you needed to use ear protection just to, just to be in the room. With the amps, sure, yeah. And, and uh, 421s, 57s? Um, his main sound uh, on that record, we, he had uh, uh, a couple of amps. Um, they were both modified Marshall heads um, that he was really fond of. And one of them had a, a, a brighter, sort of a tackier sound, and one of them was a little thicker sounding. And so we always had both of those amps going, and I was just blending. You were know. they vintage plexis or newer ones? Um, one was a, a modified JCM 800, oh. but the other one was modified in a different way, where it was a little denser sound, but not as like a tacky was he playing, and detailed sound. Was he playing through um, like greenbacks, like uh, or 25 watt? Uh, you know? Vintage 30s. Yeah, green, green ones. Yeah, the Marshall Major cabinet was an old one or a new one. Um, I think we were using on the first album. I have to. I'm trying to keep clear between the first record and the second record now. Mm -hmm. um, on the first one, um, we were using. I think his signature series cabs at that point. Oh, cool. Yeah. Because one of the things I've noticed about Slash that I really, 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 really like is that. He's not a slave to the actual vintage gear, like some like like one of his favorite guitars is a reissue of a of a '59 Les Paul. One of his yeah. favorite amps is a reissue. I I, I like the fact that he's uh, open to having n new stuff that's as good as the old stuff. Yeah, I, for him, you know, what the sort of nuts and bolts of the technology is not as important to him as how it feels when he plays. And that's the part that he's extraordinarily tuned into. Mm. You know, he can turn on an amp and play through it for 10 seconds and go, yep, or nope, <laughs> that's mm. not it, you mm. know? It's mm. pretty amazing. He's really, really tuned into that. Wow. Just because Herb and I are the host and we have the power to kick you off the show, don't, don't feel uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, cool. But he's so subtle. <laughs> I felt like the drums weren't as punchy because you used the scully okay and, and i felt like they couldn't compete with the guitars and then i thought well that's eric eric can do anything he wants so it must have <laughs> done, it must be on purpose yeah. and and so it's a rock record it's not a drum driven record but the the drums feel a little bit behind the guitars mm -hmm. and the third or fourth time i listened to that song i felt that's where it should be mm -hmm. um, am i fos um, oh, <laughs> I mean, uh, the drum sound on that particular song, that, that's my favorite drum sound on that record. Like I said, they're incredible. That skull <laughs> is one of my favorite machines <laughs> ever. Please come back, Eric. You, of course, of course. <laughs> so, you can um, stay. But, you know, that's, that's my, my personal taste. And, I, I mean, I hear what you're saying. They're, they definitely, and, uh, you know, a lot of that record is like that, where the drums were definitely desi designed to sound more specifically vintage, you know. And, and you know, the, the Scully, man, that, is, that machine has a sound to it. It's, it's it, the sound of the 60s. Yeah. And, um, and so a lot of times, that you know, Stevens. you know, you can... Um, let the Scully do its thing where it, you know, it definitely shaves off a lot of the transients and the sounds get sort of thicker and denser. It, it, it actually has a beautiful high end. It's one of those tape machines where the, after it goes through that tape machine, it sounds brighter and less harsh all at the same all time. At the same time. Yeah, Amazing. it's really, really a beautiful sounding machine. Do you, do you play on the records you produce when it's called um, for? Sure, occasionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah I wonder. Do you um, still play just for fun? Um, I, don't, I don't get a lot of opportunities to just play for fun, right. but you know, if if there is an opportunity for me to play, you know, on somebody's uh, music, it's incredibly fun. Yeah, I yeah. still love to play. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. 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 great. On uh, on the drums, did you use your four mic technique essentially? Um, that one uh, I did, and and it was um, you know, it was one of the f the first times I really got it to work really well. I felt you know were every component of the drum kit was really well represented. And it's really just a variation mm -hmm. of, you know, the, the Glenn Johns over-under thing. Mm -hmm. um, the which drums I, do sound great, all kidding aside. They really do sound spectacular. Yeah, and I, you know, the, the Glenn Johns thing was always sort of, I've tried a lot, and it sounds amazing on his records. I don't know, it's never really You're worked for me. You're calling the Glenn Johns thing a mic over the hi-hat, and a mic kind of over the, uh, the, the last tom? Well, he, yeah, he calls it, or people call it the, the over-under because there's a mic over 
rack tom, hi-hat, snare drum, right. sort of gets all of that. Yeah. And then instead of putting another mic up over here, it's down over here looking across the floor tom at the snare drum, equidistant uh, from this one. I'm right? playing with the hi-hat. With the, with the hi right? Yeah. And so um, for me, I, I just I could never get it to work. Like this guy would always get too much hi-hat, and it was just kind of a peculiar perspective for me. And so this mic ended up turning more this way. So it was sort of tucked in right next to the drummer. Mm. Hold that pose, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it's like a, an Egyptian hieroglyph here I've created. Well, you got some hand puppets, Herb. That yeah. Like an Egyptian. <laughs> yeah, and so I was able to get this mic to actually look this more this direction across the, what, the floor the, tone. The lower mic, what is that usually? Uh, it was both C12As on, on this particular recording. And what pattern? Um, card good. Both were in card. Mm. Is, 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 is what makes them work a, a manipulation of the phase between the two? Um, Do you have to spend a lot of time having an assistant move a mic while somebody's playing the kit? There was definitely some fussing around with that, you know, and, uh, you know, Josh Fries is very, very accommodating. He, pl he played those drums, and so he's used to me at this point, and I'll put mics all in his way, and he just plays right around him, you know. He's, he's awesome that way. So. It seems like recording that record was right around the time you were finalizing some betas on your EQs. Is that the first time you used the EQs on your drums? Sure, yeah. The, really? Yeah. The, All right. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the, I had five prototypes of the equalizer done at that point. Uh -huh. um, there was no console in existence yet. Um, that record was mixed with just a collection of just faders that went to a, an individual summing amp. And then I borrowed a um, an EMI console for you know that had like I don't know what it was maybe 16 channels or something like that. So I had some extra EQ with that. And well, that's if you cool. want to call that EQ, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a couple of knobs, yeah, two controls, something. yeah. <laughs> but those cool compressors, you know, yeah. that had those in it. Um, and so I sort of kludged it together with with uh, sort with of what? What's Kluged. that? Kluged? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? This stuff for us rockers. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> There's somebody laughing in there. Um, let's don't use the word dislike, but you must have been really unsatisfied with the tools at hand because you spent five years creating new versions of the same tools. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you do that? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, uh, the, I, there was two main reasons. One of them was just the, the simple reason of just having having the tools that really had all of the features that I've, I've always really wanted and mm -hmm. really felt like. So you, you love know. the sound of Class A electronics, but there were limitations in terms of like. Yeah, you know, typically Class A stuff has just very limited functionality. They're very broad brush, you know, let's, type let's equalizer. tell the truth. You can't EQ a kick drum with a Neve 1073. It just ain't gonna happen. Not, not unless you're very lucky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, Let the truth be told. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, if um, if you really want to be able to shape a kick drum sound, you need something that's a lot more powerful than that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I would typically go to a, a GML EQ or these crazy uh, Orban EQs, which mm -hmm. I know you're <laughs> not a fan of. <laughs> Can I tell that story? Yeah, after you got What's it. What's the model number of that piece of crap? <laughs> oh. A 672A last show. It's Eric Valentine. Man, I love his drum sound, so I go get me an Orban 672A. What a piece of shit. Man. <laughs> What? Why, why did you make me do that? Why didn't you? I think he sent the whole world after one so he could have an advantage with his own EQ. Are you still using it's that a EQ? Marketing ploy. Um, I, I, it has not been getting are, used. Are you still using it? I'm, I'm not using the Orban anymore now that I got my. my, my, my Man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I must have paid eight or nine hundred dollars for that piece of junk. <laughs> That's hilarious. Man, I use I used the crap out of that thing. It's all over first third eye blind record, all the Smash Mouth record. It's all over those records. Is it on Gives You Hell, my favorite record you've ever done? Uh it is, for oh. sure. Hmm. Sorry to hear that. Must be about the hands of the craftsman. <laughs> okay guys, when you see one on eBay, remember it's me. Pay extra money for it. <laughs> Let's tee up batter's box and uh throw a few pitches Eric's way. Lead vocal. Okay. Uh, 251. Oh, okay. Uh, lead guitar while we're on leads. Uh, buyer 160. Ooh. Cool. Live bass. Um, uh, a, a Bach, um, elliptical FET mic. 
Whoa. He's making that shit up. <laughs> Counts. He's okay. rounding the bases. Okay. I'll take some plug-ins and some outboard gear, too. Okay. Acoustic guitar. Um, acoustic guitar. Um, I, I got to go again on, on a microphone. I have um, Shep's 221 that's just become absolutely my favorite acoustic Ooh. guitar mic. I'm using it, it all the time now. It wasn't good enough for Slash? <laughs> I didn't have it yet. Oh, okay. Just check. Yeah. Okay, piano. Um, piano. Um, let's see. See for microphones, um, 67s, um, compression. I've been using the the unfair child a lot. On, Ooh, uh, let's talk about that. We'll on, talk about that piano. in a second. Uh, overheads. Overheads, uh, C12As, um, Coles, 4038s, um, Coles 4038s, Coles 4038s. Let's see. That's cool. Uh, room mics. Let's see, room mics, um, those Bach elliptical FET mics, uh, used those a bunch recently. Um, uh, I'm enjoying... I'm going to stop you because that's the wrong answer. Um, okay. The right answer was to take, take the mics and run them through a guitar amp and put a little bit of the guitar amp spring reverb on them. Okay. <laughs> which I got from you. <laughs> I love that technique. Okay, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm stuck in microphone mode. Let me see if I can get out of it. Attribution. I gotta out. get that in, man. That's the greatest, coolest thing ever yeah. that he does And that with actually, that. that is happening on the drum sound on that um, By the Sword song. And Ooh. in that case, the, it was just a 57 sort of in the center of the kit mm -hmm. with a Y cable on it and it went to uh, two um, Ampeg jet amps that were set up in the chamber at my place. And oh, so wow. we mic'd them close up and we mic the chamber as well. So that's what oh, the wow. ambience is on those drums. It's an incredible technique. Stereo bus. Stereo bus. Um, on Fairchild, um, I'm liking, uh, I really like the slate, um, that Mew. If she, oh, the um, one with the three. Yeah, Different yeah, the, the the Mew one of Where's their Cole? their virtual bus Cole's compressor. Virtual that one's really great. Yeah, I like that one too. Uh, strings, strings. Oh wow! Just throw you a curve here. Okay, yeah. Um, I like Cole's forty thirty eight. Um, I like uh, there's an EMI TGI compressor that's that's beautiful for uh, for fiddle or violin. Is that what you used on? Oh, wait a minute, that was a different song, sorry. I was going back to the song we were talking about earlier okay. that you didn't do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd done it, would you have used it? On? Of course. That's the good. Well, man, I'm, I'm, I'm run out. I, I, I'll concede he won. Yeah, no, he's a, he's a full count guy. He'd I would get go the that full count and then, uh, I'd help I'm, him on one. But I'm the judge. You, no, you got one or two, and there was a Bach. In the middle, but he ended but he, up. He missed. He missed. I I, I gave him a layup bonk. for the room mic. That I gave him a bonk. layup, and he didn't even <laughs> right. tell me about the guitar amp. Yeah. But but he still won. So but but you did good. You did good. You didn't embarrass yourself, which is which is I've unusual. Never, I've never won one of these. I don't know why we play this game every week. <laughs> but we do every we single. We have to change the rules. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go into the uh, the unfair child because yeah, um, if I can start you down this path. You, when, when, when I first went over to Barefoot, your studio, and looked at it, you said something to me that I was like, oh my gosh, I went and told everybody I knew. Um, there's like, how many, how many tubes are in a, a Fairchild, like a stereo Fairchild? Was it 20 or 30? Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, there's, there's four that are actually in the audio path, and then there's a bunch of other tubes that are in the sidechain path, and then the original one even had a tube rectifier in it, so there, there's a lot of tubes in it. And they, they ran the plate voltages pretty hot, so you had to change those tubes about every six to ten months, right? That, that's what it says in the original manual. That's what they recommend. You so know? if they, mullards are like two or three hundred bucks a piece and you're changing 20 tubes a, a yeah. year. The tubes that are affected by that are the ones in the audio path, so the four for each channel. So it's eight tubes. And, um, and at this point, you know, uh, the, that the original tube, a 6386, is being made again, mm -hmm. but they're still expensive. They're like 120 bucks. They don't bucks use 12AX7s mm -hmm. or anything like that? Um, in the original one, uh, we actually Probably use not. a 12AX7 in our side chain, but okay. um, I, don't, I don't remember if they use that in their side chain or not. Hmm. Describe your unit, because um, you gave me a really quick AB, and it was, I was extremely impressed. In fact, you won an award for it, right? Yeah, it got one of the you know best of show you know awards in the 2012 uh, AS. Oh, but, cool! Uh, 
a, a good used, in decent shape Fairchild these days goes for how much money? Forty grand? I, yeah, thirty, forty. And grand. your unit goes for what? Uh, six grand, something Ooh. like that. Is there a Pensado's Place discount, like fifty nine ninety nine? There will be. You know, <laughs> um, we're. I, it's been a challenging unit. You know, I mean. Uh, I really, really have been trying very hard to try and have this circuit available affordably for people. It's right. such a beautifully simple, brilliant design. And L Larry, how, uh, Larry was involved with this one. Um, there's another gentleman that has been involved with Undertone Audio. This, this gentleman named uh, Garen that um, mm -hmm. that originally brought it in for me. He was servicing uh, my tube compressors and stuff. And mm -hmm. one day he came by and said, "I, I made a, I made a Fairchild." And I was like, "Really? You made a Fairchild?" And he brought this thing in. It, it looked just like a Fairchild. Mm -hmm. I was like, "Man, you really made a Fairchild? <laughs> this wow. is crazy." Mm -hmm. And um, but he he made some really clever adjustments to the circuit at the time, and this was a, this was quite a long time ago when 6386 tubes were not being made, and so he made adjustments to the circuit to accommodate a different very new tube, this 6PC8, and those are much more affordable, and um, they they sound great. They're in a bunch of other old compressors, you know, like the the UA175s, you know, that uses oh, a 6PC8, yeah. it's a great sounding compressor. And um, so, I, you know, I started playing with it, I was like, man, I love this thing. You know, this is, you know, not only, you know, a smarter way to do it, it, I, it does things that an original Fairchild never did for me. Um, the Fairchilds sound beautiful, but they're, they're, they're a very smooth sound, you know, mm -hmm. and like this thing could get really aggressive in a way that I found very appealing. Does and it have a mix knob? There's no mix, no mix knob on it, but it has, um, you know, a bunch more time constants. So oh, cool. instead of, you know, the original Fairchild really had position one and position two that are pretty great. That's mostly what everybody uses. And the other ones, like the release time is so long that, you know. Uh, the mix knob question was, um, actually, I, that was a pretty good question because it reminded me, you, you don't like to put your compressors on the insert. You like to return them on another fader, right? Or usually, is that, is, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. You know, so I, you I, wouldn't need a mix knob. Yeah. I, I can parallel stuff on the console, so it's, it's oh, not okay. as important for me. And to do that, you know, um, we would potentially need another summing stage, another you know, gain stage in the circuit. And my concern is that it would start to get a little too far away from the original, the, the original thing to, gotcha. to include that. You know? Let's uh, bring in. We got some folks who are waiting with questions aggressively. Oh, let's so let's uh, let's introduce <laughs> Chongor, who is it's literally nursing his headache because as I was unloading Christmas boxes before the show, <laughs> my trunk hit him in the head. Oh, <laughs> so as I looked in no. the rearview mirror, I just saw him stumbling backwards with Christmas boxes. <laughs> so welcome, Chongor from Corner Office. You got hello, some questions hello, for hello. our guests? Yeah, hey, we Chongor, got... we don't have workman's comp. I figured it out. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Chongor, fire away, please. Uh, William J. Smith, what was the first album that caught your ear and inspired you musically and sonically? Ooh, good question. Um, I'm trying to think the first time, I mean, the, the first records that I really got into actually were, were the, the Monkees when I was really, really young. Um, mm -hmm. That was what really got me interested in music. But sonically, um, it was definitely, it was Led Zeppelin. It was like Zeppelin IV was the first time mm -hmm. when I, I really realized like there's, there's something really different about this. There's something mm -hmm. really special about this record. There's something magical about how this record sounds. Wow. Chongor, give us another. Don Waxy, when will, be there a, when will there be a plug-in emulation of the EQ on the undertone console? <laughs> um, that's something uh, we, we really want to do. Um, and uh, it's, just, it's, it's just a time issue mostly, you know, it's like, um, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, get our, our original prod, you know, product. The, the MPEQ-1 is in manufacturing now. That thing's pretty much going. There's is is four, it available? Um, it is available now. There's a four-channel mic pre unit. I'm trying to get that up and running in manufacturing. I'm trying to get the the unfair child up and running in manufacturing. Yeah. Once all that stuff is happening, then. Uh, then we'll we'll start looking at plug-in stuff. The output of, the, of your console. I'm sorry, I heard you real quick. The output of the console has tubes in it, so sure. the stereo bus part of the uh, that might be a good little standalone summing module too. Yeah, people have inquired about that, and mm -hmm. um, it, it could be a really useful thing. You know, it, it definitely it, it's a part of the sound for me at this point. Gotcha. And, you know, because it's a it's a class A circuit, it responds differently than than like an SSL would, where 
when you push an SSL, it starts to actually get a little cleaner. You know, when you really get it, mm -hmm. hit that sweet spot mm -hmm. on on the undertone consoles. Like when you push it, you hear it. You know, because the harmonic coloration goes up exponentially with the level, and so the closer you get to that clip point, you hear more and more stuff, more coloration come in. Cool. John Gore, a couple more. Si Simon Milliman, with such a cool collection of mics, what's the most unique way you've used a type of mic or mic something? Um, well, there's a there's a few uh, a few interesting examples. I think um, there's uh, I wanted to get sort of an under underwater sort of ambient sound on a uh, a third eye blind song, so we filled garbage cans with water and put condoms over some 57s and put them in the put them in That's the water. That's unique. <laughs> yeah, um, there's uh, Trojans. Um, I didn't. I didn't pick out the condoms. <laughs> you didn't do it. This is important You didn't <laughs> test different condoms. Guys all over the world want to know which condoms you okay. use. If, if Herb was managing you, you'd have a condom endorsement. Oh, no, I'm thinking about doing it anyway. So I'm going to call his manager and just work it out. <laughs> um, one of the other things I really, really love doing um, that doesn't happen very often is um, I'll take a, uh, a small condenser like a 451 or something put the biggest windscreen you got in the building on it and s spin it in the room while somebody's playing guitar or piano and it has this oh, cool. incredible like Doppler sort of Leslie effect. Wow. It's it's the coolest Leslie effect you can get. And I don't want to hear any more of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you think you're on top of your game, here it comes up you go, oh wow, I got a place to go. <laughs> During the mix when I'm playing it back for my client, I have Cole holding just spin anything. Just An spin. iPhone and spin coal yeah, around spin the room. Right. On a rope. That's, <laughs> exactly. There we go. That's what we'll do. That's my job. John Gore, another one. Jonathan McMallon. What is the most amount of microphones you've used while recording a drum set, and did all the tracks make it to the final mix? <laughs> <laughs> There's like some humor in that question. Yeah. Because he's known for four mics. Right. Say um, four, man, go home. Yeah. <laughs> no, there was definitely, you know, uh, the my drum micing sort of evolved over a period of time, and... Um, and so I was sort of accumulating more and more techniques that I liked. I there was a point where I was using them all, you know, and just have all of the options available. So probably the, um, the Lost Profits records was, so, was like the apex of all of that stuff. And wow. so there was like mics on the toms, there was like underheads, there was, you know, room mics in the big room, there were mics in the chamber, there was multiple mics for the kick drum, there were NS10s, like it was just an extravaganza of stuff. Did it sound better? I mean, it's, I think it suited that record. Oh, okay, so it's cool. And, and, you know, I can't say that every single element was used all the time on all of the songs, but, you know, um, I, was, I was into that at that time. And, and I think at a, at a certain point, I, I either just got tired or lazy or something and just decided, I don't want to do this with one microphone. Back uh, back in the day when I played with uh, Bob Burns, the original drummer from Leonard Skinner, he used to call it the drum. It, it, he, he thought of it as one instrument. Right. It wasn't drums. Yeah, it yeah. It was the drum. Yeah. Mike the um, drum. As a personal thank you, I think back in the early days of our show, when Dave and Will were looking at me cross-eyed, I was like, let's do live events. <laughs> and they were like, what are you talking about? Uh, our guests for our first Mix Fest yeah, was, were critical. We had yeah. done about 82 straight shows on Beyonce. <laughs> so <laughs> we needed some rock credibility. Uh, you joined us for Mix Fest, which oh, launched a whole series and in, in our ability to grow. Big thank you for that. Yeah. Mm, it's um, my pleasure. We're also going to come by your studio apparently relatively soon Later and, in the and week. shoot another visit. Correct? Yeah, yeah. So that's going to be really cool. We'll, we'll, we'll go over a little bit of the gear that we're talking about. We'll have a, the right format and time to spend a little cool. time show you the equipment. Cool. Uh, not, a, not, a, not, a, not as an advertisement to buy it, but to kind of show you, although that, will, that too, but just to show how a cat that really wants to see something done right goes about getting it cool. done. It's pretty neat. And, and another thing too that, that was kind of cool to hear from you earlier, um, we were talking before the show, give us your thoughts about this Pensado Awards thing. Cool thing? What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think it's a cool idea. I mean, you know, I think it's a great opportunity to have all of the behind the scenes guys you know, mm -hmm. um, have a moment where, you know, that is really featured in, in an award segment. Mm -hmm. All that stuff gets edited out, edited out you mm -hmm. know, in the Grammys. Mm -hmm. We can look it up afterwards, but it's like, it's not really celebrated, you know, in the other awards, you know, that are available. So I, I think it's a really cool thing. I mean, you know, a lot of these guys work incredibly hard on yeah. this stuff. Yeah. I mean, 
make sacrifices for the sounds on these records and stuff, you know. It's, it's cool. cool. That's the confirmation that keeps us going. Mm -hmm. Eric? You've got to come back. You oh, will just man. be a constant returning champion. <laughs> cool. so you're, you're never in fact, far from the show for about a month. <laughs> oh, no question, no, no question about it. Uh, can't wait to get to your studio, and, and yeah. always glad to have you. Yeah, my pleasure. David, take us home. All right, guys. Um, man, what can you say? You know, I'm going to go back and listen to this again. I know I'm going to learn some new things. The last time Eric was on the show, uh, my rate went up by about $4,000. So I recommend <laughs> studying this stuff. It can make you wealthy next week. <laughs>